Good afternoon or good morning, depending on what side of the country you're joining us from. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Charlie McQueen, President of McQueen Financial Advisors. We're here to talk today about credit union subordinated debt. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, our presentation today, we're going to have a few other people with us, and uh, we're really excited to have this conversation with a lot of things changing and uh, a lot of things changing in the, the credit union subordinated debt market. Uh, so here at Queen Financial, we were helping people achieve their subordinated debt needs and goals. Uh, works in really well with our asset liability management activities, our uh, interest rate risk, and, and what's happened with the growth of deposits has been a big area, and the subordinated debt is helping out quite a bit. Also, our investment advisory team, uh, which is helping manage all the additional cash that's out there today, and then our, our valuation team, which is part of the secondary debt group here, so secondary capital group here. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, the, the main presenter today uh, is really excited to have Zach Barr here. Uh, Zach is uh, heading up on the, the secondary activities at McQueen Financial. He's a, a member of our advisory team and valuations team, and uh, he's been working with a lot of our, our clients on all sorts of activities, a lot of bank buying activities, acquisition of um, mor mortgage companies, uh, insurance companies, all sorts of different stuff. So Zach's got a great background and a great ability to talk about all the things we're gonna talk about today. So thank you, Zach, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for so, having me, Charlie. You're welcome. Uh, next slide here, a little uh, housekeeping activity. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. If you put your mouse on your screen, you'll see a spot that says Q&A. Go ahead and click on it and uh, we'll answer it along the way if it makes sense or we'll answer it at the end if it uh, fits there better. And uh, today's webinar is going to be recorded, is being recorded. And, and if you'd like a copy of it, uh, please feel free to reach out to your advisor. It'll also be on our YouTube channel. So uh, again, any questions at all throughout the conversation, please feel free to move your, your mouse, find the little Q&A icon and tap it in there. All right, next slide here. Um, we've got a great, Great agenda today. I'm really excited, and we're going to kick off with talking about our partners, uh, which is Aloya and, and Lou Scorman. I'm really excited to have uh, Bill Patton and Jeff Cardone with us today, and I'll be introducing them in a moment. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the history of secondary capital uh, and subordinated debt. We we'll talk a little about the economic update and, and some of the things happening, which makes this an interesting time, if not a great time, to issue uh, subordinated debt. We'll talk about some structures, example financials and the process and time frame. So a whole host of things to go through here that make sure that we get you from the beginning to the end, fully understanding uh, secondary capitals or subordinated debt as the names change here, uh, but also how it would affect your financials and what you can use it for. So super excited about that today. All right, and uh, next slide here, I uh, wanna introduce the team and, and how the three of us work together. Uh, us at McQueen Financial, we are the financial analysis on the deal. We're working with the business plans, helping create the business plans, working uh, with our clients. Obviously, it has to be your business plan, but we need to modify the business plan and put it in place. We need to put a great financial analysis together to show uh, how this is going to work, how you're going to pay off the subordinated debt, how it all works. Uh, it's also extremely important for our two partners, the first one being a lawyer. Uh, a lawyer comes into this as a very important component. They're the broker dealer, they're the placement agent. Uh, they're potentially the purchaser of the debt. Uh, they may also resell the debt. They're a really important component there. Also regulatory support. They're really good at and have great relationships with the regulators like all, all three of us do. And that's something really important when uh, getting these activities achieved. The next is Lou Scorman. Lou Scorman is an incredible law firm. Uh, they've been involved in transactions for many, many years. I'm sure Jeff will give us some insight to that in a second here. Uh, they do a great job on the legal documentation, overall documentation, and also regulatory support. So the three of us have come together to put this great team together to be able to figure out what's the best structure for you, what's the best way to go with secondary capital, and then uh, to actually get it issued and correctly legally documented and issued and done. So wonderful, wonderful team. I'm really excited to have everyone uh, here with them. So now uh, we'll flip over to the next slide here. I'd like to introduce uh, Bill. And um, Bill, I'm really excited to have Bill here and thank you for flipping on and joining us. Uh, Bill's with Aloya. And uh, one of the things I do wanna mention before, and I won't read his bio because um, I hate it when people do that to me, but I will tell you something that's really exciting that Bill does head up the loan participation area. And if there's ever a time that's is important to understand loan participation than now, I don't know if there ever has been, this is the, the best time. Loans are so hard to get with all the government money out there, PPP funds, 
Uh, and so I know Bill will talk about that briefly, but heads up loan participation, lending, and then the subordinated debt activity too. Uh, so with that, uh, Bill, I'll hand it off to you. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, joining us, everybody. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Bill Patton, um, Vice President of numerous different things here at Aloya, but essentially I, I oversee our, uh, our uh, capital solutions group, our capital markets group, whatever we're calling ourselves nowadays. Uh, uh, nowadays, but uh, really, uh, you know, my job is, as Charlie said, to, to oversee the loan participation program, um, helping credit unions, you know, um, trade loans, uh, as well as access liquidity through our balance sheet, either through a line of credit um, and or now with the uh, subordinated debt. Um, so really all debt capital markets uh, related services. Um, as Charlie said, we're really, really excited about this program. Uh, we believe there's never been a better time for credit unions to uh, access, you know, subordinated debt, which you know, or what used to be secondary capital. And where we come into play, um, as as Charlie stated, was is, is we're really your placement agent. Uh, and what that means is we work with both the issuing credit union and the investing credit union to provide, you know, the best execution uh, for the trade for that security. Um, really, we quarterback the deal from a sales and distribution standpoint. Um, you know, we're going to take care of all of your administrative burden as it relates to that. Um, we can be a purchaser of that. And uh, you know, Charlie hinted at that is a lawyer as a credit union is allowed to uh, purchase that. Uh, we will do so if need be. We believe it's a great investment opportunity for credit unions uh, to do so. So we're not going to jump in front of credit unions, uh, you know, if, but we will be able to, uh, to purchase that that if need be, and potentially, hopefully down the line, create an active secondary market for this. Um, you know, we, we do have a broker dealer uh, arm, which is Aloy Investment Services, also again, a part of um, the capital markets uh, program at Aloya. And uh, that is really, really important. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about it later. And the reason why that's important is because it's part of the regulatory um, requirement that if you do not go and uh, issue this yourself, um, you do need to engage with a uh, registered uh, broker dealer. Um, you know, and finally, one piece that we, we have done, um, you know, a lawyer, what do we do? We, we offer access to capital markets and we deal with transaction and payment processes. So not only do we act as the placement agent, but we have built a piece to act as a payment or paying agent as well. And really what that does is that helps you with your you know, post-close due diligence documentation, uh, your servicing of the debt, um, all of that. So uh, we can help with the placement. We can help with the administrative burden uh, once the deal is closed. So we are there to help um, in any way we can. We're really, really excited about this, uh, both now what we built and where this is going to go to. And uh, we're exci excited and happy to be here. So uh, thanks, Charlie. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate it. It is great to have you guys here. And that payment side of it is so important too to add in there. So I really appreciate you adding in there. Yeah. All right. Uh, next, I want to introduce, we have uh, Jeff Cardone. Jeff was, is with Lou Gorman. Uh, I'm not going to read his bio either. It's, it's really long. Uh, great talent here. Uh, but um, Jeff works with a, a lot of credit unions and other financial institutions and uh, is really good at M&A and transaction advisory and lots of different components. So with that, the legal aspect is something very important, getting good legal representation in any activity. And what we've done here, and we'll talk about pricing later, it's all packaged together. And so I'm really excited to have Jeff as part of this package. So with that, Jeff, uh, please give a little bit of information about yourself. Yeah, <clears throat> Charlie and Zach, great pleasure to be here. I know we at Loose Form are very excited about this partnership with uh, McQueen and Aloy. Just to give a little more background on Loose Form, and uh, we're a 23 person attorney law firm out of Washington, D.C., and we specialize in representing solely credit unions, community banks, and other financial institutions, really corporate, regulatory. Uh, transactional matters with a real emphasis on, you know, credit union mergers, credit union acquisitions of banks, credit, you know, credit union acquisitions of fee-based businesses. We have a very, very robust capital markets practice, in particular, subordinated debt. And sort of our role in this process as counsel, you know, we, we would, you know, working very closely with McQueen and Aloya, your placement agent, we would sort of quarterback the process uh, from a legal standpoint, throughout every phase of the transaction, you know, your first phase is going to be planning, sort of learning about what is subordinated debt, 
How do you fit that into your strategic plan? How does that work from a regulatory perspective? Then you sort of move on to the next phase to the extent you want to do it. You know, you're going to have to get pre-approved by the NCUA. And if you're a state chartered institution, your state regular is going to have to be pre-approved. So sort of assisting with the deal team in terms of putting together the applications, any pre-filing meetings you may have with the regulators. And then while that's going on, we'd also draft all the various legal documents that you need. If you know, you're going to need a promissory note, a note purchase agreement. This is kind of one of the aspects of the final which I know. Charlie and Zach will really touch on is really with the NCUA's new final rule is really they're just formalizing sort of the existing process that banks are doing. So you're going to have to have these offering documents. They're also you're also going to need like what's called an offering circular. And really what that's is going to serve as <clears throat> providing, you know, risk factors to your potential investors and so on and so forth. So we would handle those aspects of the transaction. And then once you get pre-approved, <clears throat> then you transition, excuse me, to the offering phase. So you're going to go out, you're going to build your book, you're going to issue the sub debt, we're going to, we're going to enter into the various individual note purchase agreements and, and promissory notes with each of the respective investors, and we finalize and, and you know, the offering with the regulators. So that, that is really going to be our role. Um, and as I said, it's, it's very, very, we're very excited about this partnership, um, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And the last thing I'll just say... Um, you know, I think this is a very exciting opportunity for credit unions. The fact that credit unions, particularly, you know, larger institutions and beyond low income designated credit unions have access to the capital markets, very similar to banks. And I know Charlie and Zach and Bill will, will chuckle because I repeat this over and over again, even if you're on the fence about doing this, and, and I know the folks in McQueen will talk about this. There was really no harm in going in and getting pre-approved. Once you get pre-approved, that takes sort of a five-month process down to sort of a three, four-week process, because then you'd have two year, years to issue a subordinate debt. So it's highly recommended, even from an offensive or defensive strategic planning purpose. So I'll just leave it at that. I'll turn it over to folks in McQueen. Again, a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Jeff. Really appreciate that. And that, adding that little insight at the end that you can get approved and wait and not issue it for a couple of years. So that's really good. All right, Zach, next slide, and I'll hand it off to you to, to kick off. Uh, talk about where did Subordinated come from? Awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Now that you've uh, met the team, I just want to start off by giving some background on where subordinated debt came from. This is a debt instrument that's been used by the banking industry for decades. Banks, unlike credit unions, are able to issue debt at the holding company level. So on the holding company's balance sheet, they would book the debt, but then when you look at the bank level balance sheet, it would actually count towards their capital. So for regulatory purposes, a bank would be able to, to go from undercapitalized or adequately capitalized to well capitalized with a simple sub debt issuance. There's a couple different options that banks have historically had to issue debt that counts towards their capital. The first option would be what's called a trust preferred security or TRUPS. This is similar to sub debt in that it does count towards the capital ratios, but there are a few minor differences. Trust preferred securities involve a bank opening a trust and funding it with debt. The bank would then carve up shares of the trust and sell them to investors in the form of preferred stock. This was very popular in the late 90s and early 2000s, but as the Great Recession hit, we have seen that most of the time, trust preferred security issuances have been phased out, and we really haven't seen it very prevalent since 2015 as a result of the Dodd-Frank Act. The other option is subordinated debt, which is just an unsecured loan or bond that's going to rank below other more senior loans or securities. And that's also known as junior securities. And in the case that a bank would default, creditors who own the subordinated debt would not be paid out until senior bondholders were paid in full. So now that we have a little bit of background on where sub debt came from, how does this relate to the credit union industry? Well, so the sub debt acts in similar ways. 
The same way in the banking space, it does count towards your net worth calculation. Credit unions are going to pay interest on the debt issued and eventually will return the principal upon maturity. The credit union will get to count that debt towards the net worth until all it is ultimately paid off. So I wanted to give an example of what this would look like if a credit union were to issue $10 million in subordinated debt. So taking a look at the top left-hand corner here, we've got what the balance sheet would look like for a $500 million credit union. They've got about $20 million in cash, 80 million in investments, a decent sized loan portfolio, and then some other assets. On the liability side, it's mostly made up of deposits with $450 million, and then there's 40 million in equity. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you've got the net worth calculation before any sub debts issued, and the $40 million in net worth is made up of 35 million in undivided earnings and $5 million in regular reserves. So net worth ratio is 8%. Well capitalized, not bad, but if the institution wanted to have a little bit more buffer and in this case issue $10 million, on the top right hand corner we've got what the balance sheet would look like after in sub debt issuance. There's only two line items on the balance sheet that are going to change. The first is the sub debt line, you've got $10 million there and then cash goes from $20 million to $30 million and total assets overall have now increased from 500 million to 510 million. Now, the, the key difference now that you've issued the subordinated debt and really the utility of sub debt is now at the bottom right-hand corner with the net worth calculation. We still have the same undivided earnings as before of 35 million and the same regular reserves of 5 million but the $10 million issuance fully counts as net worth. So you went from $40 million in net worth to 50 million, and you've increased your net worth ratio from 8% all the way up to just shy of 10%. So as Bill at Aloya had alluded to, sub debt is considered a security by federal and state securities law. So you will have to have a broker dealer interact and facilitate the issuance. There will be a note and note purchase agreement that is going to state things like the required interest rate on the note, as well as when those interest is gonna be paid. It will also identify the term of the note um, given a maturity date more or less, which is the date that in which the principal must be repaid. For the issuing credit union, it would be treated as a borrowing and any interest you would pay would be a line item on your interest expense on the income statement. Now, given the low rate environment, we've seen a large uptick in activity in the banking space with sub debt issuances. And as far as credit unions are concerned, there is a unique rule that only applies to them in which you're unable to play both sides of the coin. You either have the option to issue subordinated debt or invest in it but you are unable to do both at the same time unless you inherited subordinated debt from the result of a previous merger. Now we do have a potential strategy in which you would be able to both issue and invest and please contact your McQueen advisor if you'd like to learn more about this. So we've been talking about subordinated debt, but sub debt has not been around for a while for credit unions and actually doesn't go into effect until January 1st of 2022. Secondary capital has been the historic route that credit unions have used to issue debt that counts towards net worth. 
Secondary Capital started in 1996 and is only available for low income credit unions with the idea being that this capital would go to those institutions that would need help the most. And typically there was very limited investment capabilities for secondary capital and it was primarily used to deal with future uncertainties with asset losses or adverse economic cycles. However, starting in the mid 2000s and as we entered in the Great Recession, there were a number of applications for secondary capital and a majority were getting denied. This was primarily due because to there was such little guidance on what the regulators were looking for within these applications. So in 2019, the NCUA sent out a letter that gave some additional language on specifically what needed to be included within those applications. And what was stated was the use for the secondary capital within your application and business plan. They would check in on afterwards to make sure that you actually put that money to the uses that you said you were going to. And then as time went on, regulators saw what was happening in the banking space and realized they needed to get credit unions on a level playing field. So they released their final sub debt rule that again goes into effect in about a month or so come first of the year. They opened up the number of institutions that would be able to issue um, so sub debt from just low income designated credit unions to also include complex credit unions, which is defined as credit unions with more than $500 million in assets as well as newly chartered credit unions. Now, if you happen to be at an institution that has less than $500 million in assets and is not low income designated, you're not completely out of luck. You have, if you're able to show that within 24 months, you meet either criteria, whether that be getting low income designated or becoming going over the $500 million asset threshold, you would still be able to get pre-approved and apply for subordinated debt. They've also expanded the investment capabilities within sub debt. So you would be able to do um, more than just ha have a buffer for capital for a rainy day. You could use sub debt to buy a bank, to build branches, to buy loan participations, to increase your bond portfolio, and a number of other items. So I've really opened, opened the, the idea and have come around to the idea of issuing sub debt and want to hopefully see more of this happening within the market. So given that that rule is just about a month away, I wanna turn it over to Charlie to discuss where we're at with the economy. Thank you, Zach, appreciate that. Um, great information there. And sub debt, it's a really important conversation now to talk about it. It really relates to a lot of things, growth functions, uh, but we've had this amazing thing happen. It's called the pandemic, which is a scary, terrible thing. But amazing the result of a pandemic is the federal government throwing money at everyone from PPP loans to individual uh, unemployment payouts to all sorts of dollars here and there. Um, money supply has skyrocketed. We have over six years worth of growth in money supply in the past year. And one thing you look here in this chart, money supply never shrinks. And so the entire banking market is bigger and it's going to remain bigger and will continue to get bigger. Now, with that, the result of this market on the next slide, you'll be able to see here, is that we've had this incredible increase of deposits. Now, this is FDIC data. It's, it's important to look at that just because of the scale of the banking market compared to the credit union market, but it's the same growth effectively. Um, but what we can see here, the last five quarters, we have a 37% increase of deposits. Unbelievable, something I've never seen in my life. I don't know when this call has ever seen this. Uh, just a huge increase of deposits. And what this really comes down to these last five quarters have made up more than five years worth of deposit growth have just happened just like that, just amazing. And so now we have all these assets on our books and the assets are primarily cash or investments and then the deposit. 
And we don't think it's going anywhere fast. People are, are slow to spend money. It's tough to spend money with all the problems going on in the supply chain and uh, housing values being so high. It's definitely hard to spend a lot of the money that's out there. We're seeing a lot of money chase things. And the next slide is the, one of the toughest slides. Actually, I think Zach will agree. This is the toughest slide we're going to talk about all day. Um, this is loan growth. And what we're seeing is the only loan growth we've had since the beginning of the pandemic really is PPP loans, the net overall loan growth. And as the PPP loans continue to pay off and they're almost done now, what we're gonna see is we've basically had no loan growth in our entire industry over the past year and a half, five quarters. And this is tough because we think about earnings. You know, we've had five years worth of deposit growth and the expenses related with that, but we don't have five years worth of loan growth. We have, we have no loan growth. And so it's going to take quite some time for us to get the loans on the books where people are needing to borrow, wanting to borrow, and then generating additional income, which generates equity. And so here we've got a way that we can actually use sub debt to come in and grow our net worth ratio in a time that's very difficult to grow earnings because of the lack of, of loan demand. Now, that's one of the good reasons from an economic standpoint, I think, to, to look at this in a serious nature. The next slide, though, is one that's an interesting one from a cost and planning standpoint. Now, those of you that know us here, uh, this is one of my favorite charts, and I have it up all the time when I give presentations. Uh, this shows the Fed funds rate, which is the red line going back from 2002 to today. The blue line is the two-year treasury, again, 2002 to today. And the black dotted line is the 10-year treasury. And uh, we go through the cycle. We go through uh, rising interest rates, then we have an inverted yield curve, then we have a falling interest rate environment, then flat, this last one was a long period of time. But then we went back up to rising rates, an inverted yield curve dropped down and flat. And here you can see the two-year treasury, the blue line is starting to tick up. Um, to us, we're somewhere, you know, if we think the last, last cycle was 10 years, this is probably closer to a five-year cycle. So we're, we're halfway through, if not maybe a little more than halfway through the cycle, and we'll start to see rates rise. And as we start to see rates rise, it'll make the cost of issuing subordinated debt go up. The cost of borrowing will go up. And so we're heading in that direction. We've got a little bit of time still, and I'm not worried about rates skyrocketing, as you all know, our economic forecast. Um, but that is a concern that the cost of, of secondary capital will go up. And uh, the next slide here, my, my last uh, economic slide for a little foreshadowing, uh, what's going on? Excuse me. Uh, the FOMC is in, in the, the rates in the market. The FOMC is predicting that interest rates rise. Excuse me. The Fed funds future is predicting that the Fed is funds will increase twice from the range of zero to 25 up to 50 to 75. And even in Feb of 23, we're now talking about even going to 1% of Fed funds. So we're looking at going from 25 basis points to maybe 1%. That's a stretch. I think we're probably going up closer to 50 basis points to 75. But that is going to cause the cost of secondary capital to go up as we're going to continue to see all interest rates slowly, slowly rise up. It might take a couple of years. It might be a little quicker. A lot of that depends on COVID, what's happening with the new COVID variant in the economy. Um, but it is a reason to think about this and potentially move a little faster than a little slower. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Zach. Thanks, Charlie. So given that rate environment that we're seeing and the expectation that rates are gonna be rising, we have seen a lot more issuances over the last 12 months or so, specifically within the bank space, as well as the credit union space. There's been almost 200 bank sub debt issuances just in the last 12 months. So I, I looked at a handful of deals here and just to try to see if we've got, there's a lot of public information within the banking space to see what kind of terms that they're getting and how it's gonna relate ultimately to the credit unions once this final rule comes into place on the first of the year. So looking at the term of a lot of these sub debt, it's mostly gonna be 10 years in the banking space. Occasionally you can see Steel Bank shares, Midwest Bank Center had a 15 year issuance. But one unique thing with uh, banks that doesn't necessarily apply to credit unions is the fact that they get to count the entirety of their issuance towards their net worth 
the entire time all the way up until the day of maturity. I'll cover this a little later, but credit unions are a little different in which the, the latter years, the entire amount doesn't count towards your net worth. So typically the banks compared to the credit union issuances are gonna be on the, the shorter end of things. The sub debt uh, values here that were ultimately issued ranged from anywhere from 10 million up to $35 million. Now there are a handful that are lower as well as higher that I didn't include within this, but I think this gives us a good idea of where the, the credit union market will, will be at for these kind of issuances. Looking at whether they're callable or not, almost always there's only two out of the 12 provided that are not callable. So the banks want to have the option that if they no longer need the subordinated debt, their net worth ratios at a, a healthy level that they would be able to prepay um, before it ultimately came to maturity. And then rates, the rates have been all over the place really from just below 4% all the way up to 4.75%. Now, a majority of the rate is going to be driven by the quality and the risk of, of the financial institution that is issuing this. And given that this is a new space for credit unions and banks have been doing this for decades, we've been quoting everyone on the four to 5% for an, inch, for an interest rate um, for credit unions that are, that are issuing this. So just slightly higher than what we're seeing in the banking market. So now that we've looked at some bank transactions, I wanna look very high level of what we're seeing from a secondary capital standpoint in the credit union space. This graph, the blue bar represents the amount of secondary capital on balance sheets at credit unions. And then the orange line represents the percentage change in those balances year over year. So on the far left-hand side at the beginning of 2019, there was roughly $275 million in secondary capital on the balance sheets. And it stayed relatively flat until the third quarter of 2020. Coincidentally, that was when COVID uh, stimulus checks were coming in and all of a sudden balance sheets inflated and net worth ratios were shrinking quickly. So as, as we saw those shrink, credit unions were aware and looked to secondary capital as a way to subsidize that net worth shrinking in the short term and we saw balances going up to, as of the last quarter, over $568 million, more than double than what it was just two years prior. So taking, taking a closer look at some recent issuances within the credit union space, there's, there's seven institutions that added or uh, just this is their first issuance for secondary capital in the third quarter. There is less information on the terms of these deals compared to the bank. So we are really only able to pick up the dollar amounts of that issuance. First one I wanted to highlight was Alabama Credit Union. They're roughly 1.4 billion in assets and they issued $30 million in the third quarter and they took their net worth ratio from just over eight and a half percent to almost two percent higher at over ten percent now this was a situation in which they issued the secondary capital specifically to buy security savings bank and we're seeing this happen more and more in the market and i expect this to happen over the next couple of years where we see a lot of credit unions buying banks and using sub debt to fund this transaction, especially given where we're at with how cheap sub debt is. A couple other ones, Florida a and they have been slowly adding to their secondary capital on their books. They added $2,000 in the third quarter, but in a, a majority of these situations, you're seeing institutions going from 
just on the borderline of being well capitalized to being really well capitalized over 10% in some scenarios afterwards that gives you that buffer you need to be able to to grow quicker than you would if you had not issued the secondary capital. So getting towards the, the structure of sub debt, there are some guidelines that we have a uh, minimum term for this debt instrument is five years and the maximum is going to be 20 years. Now, the one caveat to that was there was an emergency capital investment program funded by the treasury that was a result of one of the CARES Acts that the actually had a sub debt for credit unions that was a term of 30 years. But that was an anomaly and uh, all the future guidance indicates that the term is going to be somewhere between five and 20 years. So as we talked about before, sub debt, it erodes in the final five years for what gets to count towards your net worth. In each of the last five years, there's a 20% reduction in what you're going to be able to count towards your net worth. So we would recommend that when you structure these deals, you want to have the ability to pay down the principal balance that is no longer allowed to count towards your net worth. So as far as interest rates go, we do have a couple options. The first would be a fixed interest rate, very much like your mortgage in which you may issue sub debt at four and a half percent rate, and it's gonna stay at four and a half percent from the first day all the way up until maturity. Second option, we could do fixed to floating interest rates that might have a benchmark such as the prime rate. And those would be for those that are willing to take a little bit of risk to, for a lower upfront cost. Now, Charlie touched on it. It's expected that the rates are gonna rise over the next couple of years. So even though you might save a few bucks in the short term, we would recommend that in the long term, you would look at having a fixed interest rate on that sub debt because it's going to be cheaper over that 10 or 20 year period that you issue the debt. We also have a couple options on whether it's callable or not. When managing a bond portfolio, we usually don't like callable securities, but flipping it now that we're issuing this debt, we do like the ability to call some of the debt before maturity, especially given the degradation that happens in the last five years we wouldn't want to be paying interest on debt that doesn't have any utility for us that is not counting towards net worth. So given back to our example before with a $10 million issuance, the first five years are pretty straightforward. If you issued $10 million, all $10 million is going to count towards your net worth at both the beginning and the ends of each of the years in the first five years. Where the fun begins to happen is starting at the end of year six. At the beginning of year six, you're gonna have $10 million that counts towards your net worth, but at the end, only $8 million is gonna count. So 80% of the original issuance. And then the next year, you'll start out with $8 million counting towards the net worth and ending with $6 million counting. The same process happens in years eight through 10 until ultimately at the end of year 10, you're gonna pay back your principal and none of the original issuance is going to count towards your net worth. So now that we have a, a good idea of what sub debt is and how it's structured within the credit union space, what are the costs gonna be for something like this? Typically what would happen is you would go and, and shop for a um, work with a broker dealer and they would have a fee associated with themselves, work with a consultant that's gonna do the financial analysis piece and they're gonna have a, a fee and then you would go to a law firm as well to help you, you with the legal documentation and there would be a fee as well for that. Typically for uh, sub debt issuances, 
The placement itself is going to cost you two to three percent of the issuance. The legal side is going to run twenty-five to a hundred thousand dollars, depending on the size. And then finally, a lot of banks, uh, especially the larger banks, are going to get the debt rated, and that's going to cost you an additional fifty to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Now, we'd recommend not getting the debt rated. It's uh, not as necessary, especially if it's a smaller issuance. And typically, those costs are going to outweigh any benefits you may get from getting the debt rated. So all in all, on the low side of things, if you issued $10 million in subordinated debt, the cheap side or cheaper side would be $200,000. And then on the high end, you would be looking at $500,000 in initial costs. The great thing about our partnership, and I believe it's the only partnership of its kind that has all inclusive, the legal piece of it, the consulting and financial analysis piece, and the placement, it's all one cost of 2% of the issued debt. And a majority of the fee is not going to be charged to you until you actually issue the debt. So if you were thinking that this could be something useful for you, maybe it's not the right fit right now, but you're thinking in six months you may want to, to issue it or in a year, you actually could go through the process of getting pre-approved with us and through the NCUA and you're going to have very little upfront costs and you have an entire year after the NCUA approves it until uh, to be able to still issue it and not have to go through the application process over again. So an example of, of how this would work and how this would affect um, and it allow you to grow within your balance sheet and how it, it would get more income for you, I've got the same scenario in which we have a $500 million credit union that has an 8% net worth ratio, so they have capital of $40 million. They decide to issue the $10 million, and they're up now to a 9.8% net worth ratio. So they now have some room that their balance sheet can grow and they're still going to be well capitalized. In this scenario, we're showing growth to be 10 times that sub debt issuance at $100 million. So you went from 500 million now to 600 million in a short period of time. And your net worth ratio ultimately went from 8% to 8.33%. So that's going to have a quite a drastic positive change to the income that your institution's bringing in. We've given some conservative estimates, and that hundred million dollars of growth we have yielding at a three percent. Uh, so it's going to add the earnings of three million dollars per year to your bottom line. Now. There are some, some costs associated with this. And in this scenario, we've assumed that you're gonna raise some special deposits at a 50 basis point cost that's gonna be um, add to your interest expense by $450,000. And then you also have the, the sub debt piece itself of $10 million that's we estimate on the high end for just for this example at 4.75%. So all in all, your interest expense is going to be $925,000. But factoring in the $3 million in earnings, you're now adding over $2 million to your bottom line. And you're able to replace that, that $10 million debt with real equity that's going to be count towards net worth for forever in less than five years. So when we think about the term that we want to do, it, it would be wise to have a longer end of things at the 10 to 20 year issuance rather than just the five years. So uh, Zach, a question that came in, if you could head back to one there, um, and I appreciate the question, Amy. Would, would, ask growth, would the asset growth be in loans in this example? And, Yes, it would be an example of loans, um, loans, combination of loans and investments. It could even be loan participations from a, a lawyer. 
uh, all sorts of different things can make that up. Um, you know, I know 3% is not the easiest yield to get today, um, but I would think it'd be a combination, maybe loan participation, new loans, and some investments to, to fill in that $100 million. Great question. Thank you very much. Back to you, Zach. So to, to sum it all up, the, the debt issuance is going to allow for new growth within your institution. That six years of deposit growth Charlie was talking about is now covered. You're back up well above where you were pre-COVID as far as the net worth goes. And you were able to, to grow assets by 20% while growing your net worth. Typically, that relationship is inverse, where if you grow very quickly, your net worth is going to shrink. So thinking, thinking of the, the math portion of it, we showed 10 times the sub-debt issuance with the potential growth. But realistically, uh, you could do up to 12 times. So if I'm at an 8% net worth ratio and I issued $10 million in subordinated debt, I would be able to grow $120 million and still be where I was before on the net worth ratio. Next, we've got the, the equity piece of it. You're, you've restored it again from the, the COVID deposits that we've seen, and we're, we're still able to grow. And when we grow those assets and liabilities, we've increased our net interest income. And in this example, we have now grown earnings by $2 million per year. So in this, in this case, the simple way I like to look at it is from return on assets. We've now added over 30 basis points from uh, where we were at previously of more ROA. So now that now that you let's say you want to go down the path of issuing subordinated debt where do we go from here our process typically is taking anywhere from four to six months um, we're going to do some board and management education to make sure everyone understands the mechanics and what's going on with subordinated debt we're going to want to get you engaged with ourselves and our partners we'll typically have a call and going over what you're thinking about using subordinated debt for, as well as what kind of size range are you looking at for an issuance. And then we'll begin developing some pro forma projections. Now the language within the sub debt rule is they wanna see three years worth of projections, but in our conversations with the regulators, we actually have been building out those projections through the entire term of the debt so if it was a 10-year issuance right now, we would be building out your projections through 2031. So that way the regulators would easily be able to see that you are able to pay off that debt and remain well capitalized. Once you've decided how you're gonna use the sub debt, we'll want to uh, update a business plan and incorporate those uses. And then Jeff and his team at Luce Gorman are going to complete the subordinated debt policy. Months two and three, now we have finalized, we'll meet with a deal team and get everything wrapped up and ready to file with the NCUA. But first we're gonna have a meeting with the NCUA and state regulators if you're state chartered. Here, we're just gonna wanna find whether what the regulators thoughts are on things and if they have any concerns that we can address before we finally submit our application. Zach, can you uh, move forward to the next slide here or a yeah. month one still? Oh, I apologize. No problem. We're going to see that and let's, we'll get through the last couple here and wrap yep. stuff up. Yep. And so then we will file once we're, we're good with the business plan and the offering documents to the NCUA, they're going to have they're gonna have 60 days to um, give us a notice. Now this is a little different than secondary capital in that they can go back and on the 60th day say they need more information. Um, and it's not set in stone that they're gonna give an approval or denial in those 60 day time period. But we're going to um, also during that time while the NCAA is doing their reviews, we'll finalize our offering documents and start to 
get an idea of who's going to be investing in the debt and then begin ultimately we'll begin distributing this document to the potential investors once we get approval the, it'll be closed and then the final thing we have to do after it closes is uh, submit our offering documents to the NCUA within 10 business days of the issuance. Cool. Thank you, Zach. I appreciate that. It is a pretty quick process, five to six months, and we've got a few questions here that are gonna, we'll be talking about in just a second. Um, so please, if you have any additional questions, please submit them. we got a couple here and um, we're gonna go through these here after a slide. Um, but when I go from here is, is if you're interested in this, if you want to know more, if you want to know about how much specifically you and your credit union can get, uh, how much dollar amounts that are okay for you from an earnings standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, what additional earnings can generate based off of what you believe your loan growth can be or what we can get from a, a lawyer's loan participation program. Uh, we can go through detailed costs for your individual institution. And then really the important thing here is the financial impact and how you pay it off. Um, we put together a whole meeting with our team, uh, all three groups, and, and we make that together. So please feel free to reach out to Zach and, and we can talk about the financial analysis and uh, go through this whole process and get the whole, whole team together there. So uh, thank you, Zach. Really great presentation and uh, happy to talk with everyone going through this. Um, here, I really want to invite uh, Jeff and Bill to hop back on and uh, go through some, some question and answer time. And again, if anyone has any questions, please uh, feel free to shoot them into the Q&A section. Um, one of the questions came up, uh, a, a client is in a, um, they're wondering if their state, whatever the state may be, uh, not state of mind is crazy or state of mind is fun, but state of the country, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, North Carolina, whatever it may be, um, e even though the, the, the credit union is the, their state chartered, uh, they would still follow the state uh, the NCUA guidelines. Is, is that correct, guys? That is correct, legally. You're, if you're federally insured, you're going to, the NCUA's rules that Zach and Charlie just laid out or summarized would govern. Uh, you just would have to notify your state regulator in terms of what you're doing and whatnot and, and seek their approval as well. But generally, there are experiences, they're very deferential to the NCUA. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. Uh, next question that came in was actually uh, directed towards uh, Bill and uh, talking about uh, loan participation. Since I, I mentioned loan participations is one option to help uh, to use to, to grow the earnings from secondary capital, are you seeing a reasonable deal flow of loan participations in the market today? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, in fact, I was just shooting an email over to, to some of our team. We uh, we are starting to see a turn in that market, right? So the way the loan participation market is, it's never exactly the perfect equilibrium. You know, either theoretically there's more sellers or theoretically there's more buyers. Um, but what we are starting to see is more inventory come through uh, our platform. Um, and that's various different types, right? So you're getting, it's not just auto loans, uh, which historically have been the, 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 the most frequently uh, traded loan or MBLs. We're seeing mortgages, all different types of that, unsecured loans. Um, so more and more inventory is coming through, um, and it's a great time to buy comparatively. Um, so I, ho I hope that answers the question yep, uh, without getting into too much detail. Yep, no, perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I have two questions, and one's probably a, a little better of a closer. And, and this one, I don't know the answer to it, actually. I, I, I think I do, but I'm going to try to stump you guys because I might be a little stumped. Um, we have a credit union that is a state chartered and privately insured. Are they mm. able to issue a secondary capital? I'm going to be the first to answer this and I'm going to defer that one to Jeff. <laughs> Great answer. Uh, if I had a guess where this credit union located, it, it, I would, my sense would be probably Massachusetts. Or um, Indiana. So That's a good spot. Indiana. Too. Ohio, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the answer, the answer is yes. Um, but we would have to check with your state and, and, and their requirements. And it's very likely, I haven't had one of these yet, but while you may not necessarily be subject to the requirements of the NCUA, there's a lot of best practices and things that you should be doing, which, sort of, which is really what drove the NCUA to put out the guide. Like, for example, if you were going to issue sub debt, 
you're going to want offering documents, you're going to want a placement agent, you're going to want to do all the things that are sort of mandated by the rule. But generally, you'd have to go and check with your your state on that. Yeah, and I think, Jeff, that's the safe answer. My dangerous answer would be somewhere along the path of uh, usually you can do everything else that a, a federally insured credit union can do with a private insurance, but it may be up to your private insurer too. So I'd have to think there's a couple ways to check there. But I love the question. Thank you. And if we could help you with those conversations with your regulator, please, please let us know. Please let us know. Excuse me. Uh, another question that uh, popped up and uh, oh, the time frame is the question. And, and uh, from here, you know, Zach can kick off and Bill and Jeff add in. Um, does the time frame really take six months in <laughs> question mark? So uh, it, what, what's the real time frame here, Zach? Yeah, so it, it truly depends on how much thought you've given to what you would do with a sub debt issuance and how much you're looking for. If you already have a well-established reason to issue sub debt, it's going to be on the shorter end of things, more like a four month process. But if this is something that you're still in the exploratory stage, and um, just learning about it, that stage will take a couple months and could increase it to the six month time frame that we talked about. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, with that, let me open up to uh, Jeff and Bill. Jeff, first and Bill, any closing comments you'd like to provide to everyone before we wrap stuff up today? Yeah, I mean, I would just to, to, just to touch on what Zach had howling before and what I mentioned before. Um, you know, we have a lot of conversations, strategic conversations with credit unions. And I always like to say, or my thought is, you know, really from a capital perspective, you want to avoid what I call just in time capital. You never know what, the, what strategic opportunities are out there or reasons you may need capital for defensive purposes. So uh, I'll say it again, as I said before, I know Zach had said it, even if you're on the fence, strongly recommend going in and getting pre-approved to the extent you're either low income designated or you have assets greater than 500 million. It makes total sense. Uh, interest rates are still historically low and, and banks are doing this hand over fist and it's a really nice tool, a capital raising tool for credit unions. So we that. You. I appreciate that, Jeff. And being in Detroit here, I was joking with one of our, our advisors in our California office uh, about automotive activity and uh, just-in-time manufacturing didn't really work well for a lot of automotive industry like, lately. So I, I like the just-in-time capital. Uh, Bill, yeah. hand off to you. Any any closing comments? Yeah, I, it, just really what I want to do is 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 highlight the partnership. You know, you know, we talked about the you talked about the the time frame. You know, could be six months because of our partnership and the way we work. We're able to work on different things at different times. So. As long as we feel and you feel good and you're you're ready to go on this, while Zach is working um, on building the financial plan, Aloy is building the sales plan and the distribution plan and getting that out there. And Jeff's working on on the documents. So a lot of that time that is being wasted, wasted quote unquote, is really being held up with outside of our control. So everything that's being done on our end is a much shorter time, but a lot of that is being held up. At the NCUA, you know, they're, they're taking their time um, to look at and, and review those plans. So it's a real strong reason why you may want to partner with us uh, for that. That turnaround time uh, is really imperative, especially now, given, you know, rates could rise fairly quickly, quicker you're able to issue, um, quicker you can, you can lock in that rate. So just want to highlight that. And thank you, but I appreciate that. It's, it is definitely, uh, there's a lot of time in waiting with regulators, but as a team, we can work on all different things at once, which is really great to hear. Zach, any closing comments for you? I don't have any. Perfect. Then we covered it all. Well, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, for, for joining us today, uh, Jeff, Bill, Zach, for the presentation. And Zach, if you can roll to the next slide here. Uh, I'd like to wrap stuff up. We're, we're really excited. We do have our, our next webinar coming up on December 14th. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun there. We're going to actually talk about uh, what is coming out in the industry, what's happening in the industry. We're going to talk about uh, uh, transactions that are taking place, valuations, and really an industry transaction update is our normal end of year update. So it'll be on December 14th, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. With that, again, I really want to thank uh, Bill joining us uh, in Aloya, a great partner, Jeff joining us from Luce Gorman, a great law firm, great partner. And Zach, I want to thank you for the presentation today. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon.